Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another World Championship bonus edition of Perpetual Chess. I am recording this on Sunday, December 5th, and we have just completed eight rounds. And boy, have things changed since the last bonus podcast. Magnus Carlsen has won two out of three games to take a commanding 5-3 to lead in the match with six games to go. And we have two awesome interviews to share with you guys. Number one is with legendary nine-time Dutch champion and award-winning author, Grandmaster Jan Timmen. Jan joined me from a phone interview from his home in the Netherlands in the middle of game eight. In fact, just after Jan Napomnici's fateful blunder on move 21 when he went B5. So at the time, Magnus taking a two game lead looked reasonably likely, but was far from guaranteed. But we wanted a more big picture view anyway from this legendary chess player and historian. And in our interview, GM Jan Timmen contextualizes the match. He discusses the format and the debate about draws and all that stuff. And he shares some fascinating insights and inside info on the rise of Grandmaster Ali Reza Faruja as we start to think about future future world championships. For the second interview, we're joined by USCF master trainer and Twitch streamer, John MacArthur. I recorded an interview with John on Monday, November 29th. So we do not talk about the current conditions of the match, but John had just gotten back from Dubai, which was his sixth world championship attended. He told some amazing story stories from those accumulated experiences, and he gave great perspective on how Dubai compares to other venues and experiences. Before we get to the interviews, I'm going to do a very brief summary of each game, but the timestamps are in the show description, so if you're already caught up on the match and want to go straight to the interviews, you guys know how to do that. Well, if you're still here, let's get to it. So let's start with game six. Wow. The longest chess game in history, in world championship history, as FM Mike Klein alluded to, it was a single game that almost felt like a series of novels, 136 moves, almost eight hours. It started on a Friday at 430 Dubai time. It ended on a Saturday. Uh, Magnus in this game tried a creative opening gambit, In another sort of Catalan hybrid type opening, Uh, Nepo again sidestepped it, perhaps wisely, and managed to steer it to basically an equal position. Um, From there, things really picked up, though. The game had huge time pressure, massive swings in the evaluation of the position during that time pressure, and ultimately a vintage Magnus win. This game was was more sport than art. Mistakes and brilliancies were both on full display. I hope and guess that you all had some time to watch some recaps of this game. It's an amazing slice of chess history that we got to witness. Um, And you may even want to watch a replay or two of this game. It was just so thrilling and tense to watch it in real time. Magnus, of course, ultimately won and broke the deadlock. Um, The one point I want to highlight about this match is that uh, Jan Napomnici deliberately steered towards imbalance in this game. Um, I don't know if it was due to inertia or I know he said in the press conference he liked that he had uh, the two bishops early in the middle game and then ultimately, as Jan Timmen mentions, decided to go to a queen against two rooks endgame. But all three results were very possible in this game and it especially could very easily have been a draw at many points. So while the uh, the... Um, death of classical chess by draws narrative that we've referred to in previous wrap ups. While that will be going back in its box for now, just keep in mind that draws are always possible in classical chess. And we, of course, could have had more of them. Instead, we got this thriller that culminated in just some amazing technique under pressure by Magnus Carlsen to take the lead after game six. Now, Game 7 was more like a consolidation game. Nepo again was white, and again he got a small advantage in an anti martial Roy Lopez. In fact, the same exact variation as their prior game with Nepo playing black. Um, But again, Magnus did what he needed to do in order to neutralize a small edge. There were a few moments where maybe Nepo could have pressed a bit more. But chess is hard, and Magnus is a tough customer. So the pieces ended up came 
coming flying off the board for a fairly quick draw, as I'm sure both players were still recovering from the eight-hour banger the day before. Now, game eight, which was earlier today, of course, um, again, the human element was on full display. Magnus, it was a Petrov, so Magnus switched to E4. Um, He steered away from some somewhat promising dynamic possibilities around move nine and move 10, especially the move C4 uh, looked interesting. Um, And he appeared okay with the draw as white. In fact, Magnus said in the post-game press conference that he discovered as he sat and thought for 40 minutes before picking his move that his brain was just foggy. So he ended up consciously choosing a line in 10 queen one check that he described as insipid. Um, Nepo avoided the calmer waters, waters, but also may have been suffering from fatigue as he made a significant blunder with 21 pawn to b5, which basically just blundered a pawn, uh, therefore blundered the game and possibly gave away the match, although that remains to be seen. Um, It has to be said that Nebo has been just pure class in every interview after every game, um, and he apologized for his performance in the press conference today. I personally don't think an apology was necessary, but you've got to feel for the guy. Uh, I mean, these games are so taxing. Game six in particular was taxing to even watch, and then to have to get back up and play the strongest uh, player in the world in subsequent games. It's it's amazing to see the way that Nepo has comported himself. So now we stand with a 5-3 lead for Magnus. Uh, Ty Bruce Zimmerman of the Chess by the Numbers blog now has Magnus as a 99% favorite to retain his title, believe it or not. Um, that doesn't account for any sort of increased probability of violence on the chessboard. Nepo, of course, will likely be throwing haymakers with both colors now. So I don't know if 99% is right or not, but I would dare to say that we probably have not seen our last decisive result in this game. And, uh, and uh, Ty highlighted the point that even if Nepo were to win the next game, his model would still have Magnus over 90% to retain his title. Again, these are just numbers when we have humans playing as we have seen throughout this match. So certainly I'll be staying tuned and recommend that you all do as well. So on that note, let's get you all to these two fantastic interviews. We'll be back with our regularly scheduled adult improver perpetual chess on Tuesday. And then we'll be back with another bonus pod for the next rest day heading into Friday, December 10th. And while this match could possibly end before 14 games, it will definitely still be going heading into Friday. So thanks for listening, everyone. And please enjoy these interviews, starting out with Grandmaster Jan Timmen after the break. Hello, everyone. And we are here with the legendary nine-time champion of the Netherlands, who, of course, played GM Anatoly Karpov for the FIDE World Championship in 1993. He's an award-winning author, most recently of the unstoppable American Bobby Fischer's Road to Reykjavik. He's a founding editor and a columnist at New in Chess magazine and discussed his expectations for the match in their recent World Championship preview digital issue. And I thought it would be fun to get a sort of mid-match report. Now, we're recording in the middle of Game 8 at what may be a critical moment as Jan Nepomnici may have just blundered and uh, Magnus has just played Queen A3 check, which it looks like he's going up a pawn, but I want to focus more big picture on the match. But first, let's welcome our esteemed guest back to the show, Grandmaster Jan Timmen. Thanks for for joining us. Yeah, it's okay. It's also my pleasure. Yeah. I'm, I'm delighted to speak with you always. As I've mentioned before, you're one of my favorite authors of all time, in addition to all of your achievements over the board. So uh, I just want to hear your historical perspective. How has this match played out as compared to what you expected, uh, Grandmaster Timmen? Well, I think that it's, it's more or less what, what I expected. I think that uh, Carlson was a clear favorite before the match started. And I saw actually chances for uh, Nepom Niachi, and I still see some chances for him. But uh, let's say in, in general, I think that uh, overall, uh, Carlson is a better all-round player than uh, Nepom Niachi. Yeah, and of course, one of the narratives going into the match was uh, about uh, Nepom Niachi's resilience or possible lack thereof and as as we record this it seems like magnus may may be able to to pull ahead if he can can win another game was that um a theme that that you were alert for going into the match uh jan 
Well, I think actually the, the game that Mastner, the first game that Mastner's won was actually quite uh, well typical, or, because uh, in in this game I think that Nepal Miyagi uh, didn't show actually uh, good uh, understanding in general to go for this uh, exchange of queen for two rooks, although uh, it is still uh, zero zero according to the computer. In general, this is this is not a good idea. It's certainly not a good idea to play for a win in such a position. And although the the game was actually quite complicated and Black had uh, reasonable chances at some moment, I think it, he should have refrained from that and he should have just um, made a very solid draw. Yeah, it was quite surprising, introduced a large imbalance into the position and, of course, changed chess history because prior to that, uh, the pr- the predominant narrative of the match had been the preponderance of draws and the seemingly potentially never-ending string of draws. And I want to return to that subject, but first let's discuss Game 6 a bit more, Jan. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming most listeners have at least reviewed the game and are aware of its contours. Jan, what was your approach to watching that game? Were you glued to your seat the whole time or checking in periodically? Well, it, was, it lasted about eight hours, so I don't think that uh, I was there all the time because I was doing some other things as well. Because I, I, of course, I follow the games. But meanwhile, I, I also work uh, on a new book about uh, the selected games of uh, Max Over, my uh, uh, my compatriot who was world champion in 1935. So I just alternate. Uh, that's and excellent. Of course, I, I, I followed the game, and uh, from time to time, and I saw that uh, Magnus was actually. Uh, no, oh, making progress, and it looked uh, very unpleasant for Black all the time, basically. Yeah, a few a few moments where Jan could have turned the tables in time trouble, but mostly he was suffering. Um, in those tense moments, were you watching the time trouble period of the match, Jan? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, the, the time uh, trouble period was it was a bit confusing, especially if you looked at the uh, computer analysis. I mean, in former days, uh, such a position. It would have gone unnoticed that uh, that Carson, for example, missed a win when he could retreat his rook uh, from c5 to c2. Yeah. That would have gone unnoticed in the past, but uh, it, it's actually a very complicated variation that the computer pointed out. Yeah, easy to see when the computer's screaming it, but yeah, not a very human move when you have seconds on the clock. And do you generally watch with commentary on if you're tuned in at a moment like that? I watch at uh, Chess Bomb. So you have some uh, superficial computer analysis, but I I don't look at commentaries now. Okay, so you just form your own impressions and seeing. I don't I don't want to hear a voice when I'm uh, looking at chess. I just want to concentrate on the game. But sometimes I look at uh, the tweets on uh, Chess Twenty Four. Ah, okay, yeah, and it it makes sense. A player of your strength, you're of course able to follow what's going on um, on, on your own. Now, how do you? When you see them manage their clocks like that and get in supreme time pressure in such a high stakes moment, does it recall any moments from your career, Jan? Oh, sure, because actually now they have uh, returned to this uh, the playing schedule uh, where you have uh, no uh, uh, increment uh, before move 60. And i uh, actually quite uh, enthusiastic about that. Also, when I played uh, Karpov, in, uh, we, we played this match in Murmansk in uh, 2016, we also had no increment before game for before move 40, and that was my proposal. I think in general this this time pressure is uh, very exciting, also for for spectators. And I I agree that increment should be there, but it shouldn't be too early. Yeah, I find it quite entertaining as well. And of course, FIDE often comes under criticism, but I definitely commend them for that. I mean, it was just such a high stakes moment seeing them both with their their time hanging in the balance. And Jan, I don't know, you mentioned you follow Chess24s. I'm sure you read some coverage as well as following their Twitter feed. Uh, What was your opinion generally about the sort of uh, escalating complaints about the preponderance of draws prior to Game 6? Well, I think that that is something that that has happened in many matches. So for example, the if you look at the first match between uh, Spassky and Petrosian, also the first six games were uh, drawn. That that can just happen with some players of this level. 
and they they were very well prepared. I think actually that uh, that Nepo Miyachi so far he has only played uh, Rui Lopez with right. I think that if he wants to, and I think he should have done this already before. He should vary, play some other lines, try yeah. to find some some new ways. So it doesn't matter what, maybe to play Italian, the the Joker piano or something like that, which is very popular nowadays. Just to to to, to uh, put pressure on uh, Carlson. Yeah, well, with with this ongoing game potentially leading to a two-game deficit, or at, I would think at best a one-game deficit, we certainly might see some different opening choices in the second half. And what about with the black pieces? Do you think do you foresee changes for Jan there? Well, I think he has done uh, very well with black. I have no, I, I don't think he could have done better. I th- he was actually uh, well, very hardly ever under pressure. I mean, also the game that he lost, he got a. Uh, a completely uh, satisfactory position in the early middle game. He could have exchanged queens, for example. I don't know. I, I don't understand what he actually what his mindset was. Was he trying to win with black? I'm not so sure. Yeah, he mentioned but, in the press conference that he felt with his two bishops that he might have a slight advantage. Yes, well, maybe he had some slight advantage, but uh, on the other hand, uh, white is very solid. And uh, later on, this this weakening of his king side actually became problematic. And uh, to play for a win when you you have a weakened king side in general is a bit problematic. Yeah, and and we have a related question to uh, to the the number of draws, which is um, from supporter of the podcast Courtney Fry, who just asks. He says, "In the coming age where computer engines reign supreme, where do you see the future of chess in the next thirty years? Do you think we'll start seeing mainstream changes to the way chess is played, so that humans can compete against each other without being excessively influenced by deep computer lines, or where time controls change? Uh, what do you think, Jan?" I think in, in, it is difficult to say, and I don't think uh, that we can improve that much. Uh, I think that all proposals, for example, the Fischer Random Chess, are not very satisfactory. And also Kramnik's idea to uh, to delete castling, I think uh, that doesn't really make the the game more interesting. I think that uh, what we have now is, uh, is the traditional chess, which has a very long tradition going back for many centuries. And I think we should keep it that way and hope for the best. That's basically what I think. But on the other hand, yes, what, what can you do about this computer analysis? Uh, the, the, I think that the, the players nowadays, they work really hard. And computers get better and better. And uh, I think it's very interesting work. And uh, I always hope that they play some sharp lines. There may also be draws there, but uh, it becomes more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, feed, I did speed things up a tiny bit. And as you say, with no increment. So yeah, I think as long as changes are made that at the a, margin, go ahead. Yeah, that is a good improvement. I think you may, may even speed up the game a bit. Maybe, maybe just make a, make it uh, 40 moves in one and a half hour. Yeah, something like that. Because I know that traditionalists might complain. But the, the fact of the matter is, the more moves that are memorized, the fewer the players are playing on their own. Yes, that is true. Yeah, yeah. Of and uh, and Jan, uh, I'd, do you have any other sort of broad perspectives about this match? Anything else that you found especially noteworthy? Well, of course, the the the, the choice. The, I mean, the, the qualification of uh, Nepo Amniachi is uh, is a bit surprising if you look at the world ranking list. But on the other hand, he he did uh, very convincingly in the candidates' tournaments in both uh, halves. So. Uh, he deserved to be uh, the challenger at this particular moment. But, I, 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 well, in fact, I only gave him an outside chance. He, he should uh, have uh, leaned very heavily on the openings preparation. Otherwise, uh, I think in the long run, he will uh, certainly lose to uh, Carlson. Yeah, you highlighted nicely the quality of his play leading into this match. But, uh, yeah, the, the story may be getting rewritten. And returning to the topic of chess format, one one. Um, suggestion that I've heard with increasing frequency. Um, it's p- perhaps becoming less relevant in this match, but the idea of playing the rapid tiebreak before the regular match, do you have an opinion on that uh, potential tweak? Yeah, I know. I've been thinking about that. and uh, I think it's an interesting idea, but I don't think it's, uh, 
it's it's that satisfactory. It, it it it's it's a bit funny to do that. It's confusing. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I guess that there there is no perfect solution. Um, no, no, there's no perfect solution. That is for sure. And we have uh, one. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think actually that that Fisher's idea was not that bad. So that that the challengers should win with two points difference because that that and the, the draws not counting. That that is still actually a very interesting idea, but it, it's difficult to organize these days. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's it feels like a blessing to even get these these fourteen games for sure. Um, and speaking of Fisher, of course, your most recent book the, uh, is highlighting Fisher's dominance. And we have one more listener question from Igor Feinstein, which is in light of your recent book on Bobby Fisher, which he said he intends to buy and which I've been greatly enjoying. He says, uh, how would you compare his style of play and will to win to that of Magnus Carlsen? I think it's very similar. Uh, I, I wouldn't say actually that, uh, that uh, Carlsen is uh, worse from this point of view. I think that in general... All world champions at, at something extra. Even even some very quiet person like Smyslov. He, he had a very strong will to win. But I think for uh, both Fischer, Kasparov, and Carlson, this is exceptional. Their push. Also, actually, Karpov must be mentioned. Yeah. yeah. But I think that, that there's, there's very little difference in, in the way um, Fischer won the title and Carlson won it. They were both very motivated to be the strongest in the world. Yeah, and it's it's good to see Carlson defend his title a bit more than Fisher. <laughs> yes, well, of course. Well, Karpov was uh, basically uh, just a very natural talent, and uh, it was very hard to stop him in general. But he was a, a bit uh, lazy uh, compared to Kasparov. Yeah, and it was interesting in your book to see you highlight your two favorite, your two heroes growing up were Bobby Fischer and Bob Dylan. Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. Uh, yes, I made this comparison that they both uh, withdrew, actually, from the scene for, for uh, one and a half year, which is quite interesting here. Yeah. I think they, um, Fischer probably admired uh, Bob Dylan as well, and vice versa. Yeah, Fisher, of course, an avid avid music fan. Um, yes. And as this match, um, you know, as we record uh, and win for White here in uh, Game 8 is looking increasingly likely. So if we were to dare look ahead to another world championship, uh, Jan, I, of course, have to ask uh, what you think of uh, Grandmaster Ali Reza Farouja's recent play. Well, I've been following him already for some years, and... Uh... I think that he's really impressive. Well, the, the fact that he's only number two is, is just a clear sign that he uh, he will be up there. He will be uh, a challenger one day. That uh, that is very hard to imagine it going differently. Of course, he has to prove himself in the candidates' tournament, which is not easy, because there you play every day against a, a certain level of player that is not easy to beat. And nerves may become a factor. But on the other hand, I mean, his potential is incredible. And, uh, yeah, I've been following him already for years, as I said, and I've seen him play uh, in in Hogeveen, in Holland, when he played a match and uh, he, he against Corey, and he was uh, really impressive there. So I was uh, just playing very close by him on the same stage. So what and, impressed and I had, you? At the time, I had uh, contact with his father. We had uh, breakfast from time to time together. Well, actually, uh, I was uh, still sleeping, probably. And did his father ask you for any sort of advice? Yes, yes. He, he asked me. Uh, he also uh, asked me, but he didn't ask this directly. But he asked whether I was doing some training these days. And, uh, but I, <laughs> and what would be a good trainer? For his son, but at that time I I didn't think that I was the right person to do this because it is far too much work. You need a younger person. I'm uh, almost seventy, and uh, I think I can uh, I cannot do that amount of work on openings. Yeah. I could ca- actually give uh, uh, players advices, of course, in a match. Uh, for example, if I would be uh, the advisor of. of of uh, Nepon Miyashi, for example, I could give him 
there's some advices about opening choices, maybe about other things that are important. Of course, but uh, but not not real the real work. No, I couldn't do that. That makes sense, and I'd like to return to that in a second. But first, uh, what advice? Assuming, let's assume that Nepo falls behind two games here in in game A. What advice would you give him going forward? Well, try, try some other opening for sure. Yeah, with White, and uh, I think in general, uh, try to play sharp with Black. Yeah, it could uh, be a very entertaining second half of the match if uh, if this yes, result let's holds. If, if Carlson plays e four. He could consider to play the Sicilian. That would be very interesting. Maybe just a night of variation, something like that. With White, he could play anything. He could play, let's say, some some C four opening. Maybe some some flank game. That we, that was actually the secret that uh, Kasparov used in Seville in uh, 87 against Carpo for the last game, for the final game that he won. He played a non-committal opening. And yeah. something like that, I think that uh, could be advice to uh, Nepo Miyachi if he's too down. Yeah, definitely we'll have to uh, to come out swinging. And re- returning to the topic of your conversation with uh, Grandmaster Ali Reza Faruja's, uh father, did did you recommend any specific trainer for him in this conversation? I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't. I, I said I would think about it, and I actually didn't come back to it. And uh, I was thinking about it, but I couldn't think of anyone who would be suitable. <laughs> it's understandable. It's not that easy. Especially yeah. given, given his recent results, there's no one who can teach him anything, it would seem. Yeah, that, I already had that feeling that it was not easy to find someone who would be very useful for him. At, and he probably yeah, doesn't need it. On the other hand, if he. Which is the candidates, I guess, that uh, that he probably needs uh, good seconds, yeah, for sure. And have you heard anything about, obviously he's had an incredible few months, have you heard anything about either pl- people he may have been working with or what exactly he's been eating? <laughs> no, no, I, actually I was surprised that he uh, is not going to play in Vacancy, but apparently they d- couldn't come to financial conditions. Oh, interesting. I wondered about yeah. that. So it's good to know because, you know, you'll you'll see people complain online as if someone like Ali Reza wasn't invited. So sometimes you just can't come to terms. Yes, he, they couldn't come to terms. Apparently he asked uh, a very good uh, fee and I, uh, well, I'm in favor of that, of course. I think that young players should do that, especially if you're so successful. You must ask a very good fee. And uh, if organizers don't want to pay it, okay, then don't play that's the consequence i had this in the past as well yeah that's especially something interesting to watch as because presumably ali reza has not has not concluded his ascent yet so if he's going to be uh demanding conditions that that are not often met it'll be interesting to see that how that plays out in uh in future potential matches and tournaments yes yes um, well, Jan, I want to thank you so much. Um, so you, you're currently working on a book about Max Oive? Yes, and it will come out probably, uh, I think, uh, mid-23. Uh, 2023. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we will look forward to that, and I cherish all of all of your books. Um, do you have anything to add, Jan, before we let you get back to your life of uh, writing and occasionally checking in on these chess games? Yes, I uh, want to add that uh, these games of over are really quite good. I, I'm uh, commenting now on the game against Bogolyubov from uh, 1921, and I just finished uh, a game that he beat Maroxi, also a brilliant game. And uh, yeah, and I'm doing this with a lot of uh, joy. It's very joyful work to work on this uh, games of over. That's excellent. And I know that you did some engine checking in your recent book on Fisher. What's your general approach? Do you have the engine on the whole time or do you compile your own notes and then go back and look? How, how do you handle that these days? Well, the point is that uh, you cannot always uh, come up with all these lines that the computer finds. You have to make cuts and you have to explain things. And it's not always easy. But I do my best. But the computer is very helpful if you, you want to comment on games. And anything in all of the games you've recently looked at, both for Bobby Fischer and for Max Orive, were there any sort of shocking discoveries with the um, with the help of the computer? 
Well, at the moment, no, I cannot think of anything, no. Well, uh, there was one... I, I found something very interesting in Endgame that um, that overbeat Janowski in the first round of the Staunton tournament in uh, 1946. Okay, well, we will look forward to the details of that in your book in 2023. And Jan, just want to thank you again and look forward, as always, to your, your future books and your columns in uh, New in Chess magazine. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Enjoy the match. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am here with another old friend. He is straight off of the plane coming from Dubai, back in New York. He is a USCF master, a longtime scholastic coach in New York City, uh, one of the originals to my mind. He is a chess streamer. He streams under the name Master Chess Dojo, of course, not to be confused with uh, Kostya Kavutsky, Jesse Cry, and David Pruce's uh, Chess Dojo. Uh, he's coached many national champions, including uh, Grandmaster Mark Arnold. Um, and he just attended his sixth world championship. He's also a um, registered FIDE trainer and been to six world championships. He's been sharing his pictures of uh, Dubai on his Facebook and other socials. And I've just, again, been watching and been jealous. So I wanted to get the rundown from this trip and also just sort of a broader comparison to the many other world championships our guest has been privileged to attend. So let's welcome John MacArthur. John, what's going on? Thank you, Ben. You're doing a terrific job with the podcast. I am such a fan. Thank I you. I, yeah, I really appreciate that. And for listeners, John and I go way back. We often taught the same classes back in like 2001, 2002, which has been a theme with recent guests who are somehow all convening in du Dubai, except for me. Um, <laughs> so while well, I sit here in New Jersey in my basement, but, um, but uh, John, so Tell us about the trip. Like, what what's your greatest memory from it at this moment? You know, without having had full time to process it, but I I saw a lot of pictures with legends. So, uh, what what do you think most fondly of at this moment? It was great to reconnect. I think there's no event like the World Chess Championship to uh, really sew together the community of uh, serious chess players, and uh, and the community really does bond around this uh, this event because you're not there necessarily to play, such as on the first day when I was uh, in the playing area and I realized I'm in this room watching the two players when I could easily be outside uh, analyzing the game with my friends, as well as is often done. There are chess boards that are set up outside the hall, and occasionally there's some analysis boards near a cafe or anything like that where you can uh, analyze with friends and people walk up. And you know, there's no shortage of strong players available, not unlike Vichy Anon being accessible. In 1990, I remember I had the board set up uh, and Boris Spassky walks up and shakes my hand. He's got a huge basketball player like hand and he has me by about four inches and I'm six one. I wow. don't remember how tall he is, but I know he was taller than me. Or maybe that was just my impression because when Baskey walks up to you at a world championship, you think, huh, right? <laughs> like yeah, it's all figuratively, if not, if not literally, but it sounds like both. Yeah. Right. Um, and was that at a world championship as well, John? That was the 1990 uh, Hotel Maclo. Uh, I think it was the 1990 New York Lyon match. For the last half of that, I had to fly to Oslo for an armed forces tournament. So again, each of the world championships, I only got to see a portion of it with the exception of uh, 1995. I was very lucky when uh, PCA organizer Sophia Rode and uh, John Donaldson, International Master John Donaldson and I head up the press room at the top of the World Trade Center. So that's Kasparov so, Anand. That was and Kasparov Anand. And the aforementioned 1990 was Kasparov Karpov? Karpov, yes. Wow. And they, uh, they had like uh, also analysis stations with many grandmasters in a variety of different rooms. In the World Trade Center, they had analysis stations in all four corners, as well as the central location with Grandmaster Maurice Ashley. And uh, that was very eerie, of course, because we were at the top of the World Trade Center on the anniversary, I think, of the previous of the previous bombing in the garage. So they wanted an official event to reopen the World Trade Center after the tragedy of uh, of the attempted terrorist attack from I don't even remember when the car 
uh, garage bombing was, but uh, it was quite an event. And I'm very thankful to the PCA and Intel for sponsoring that and Sophia Road for giving me that opportunity. Amazing. So many world championship stories. And what about this one, John? So um, I got the impression online that FIDE's communication wasn't amazing about like how to get tickets and stuff like that. Oh. So, oh my God. <laughs> so when oh, you, you, I did not have a ticket for the first game when I, I went was going to ask. Yeah. I don't know if you caught part of that or if anyone watched my stream because I was actually streaming uh, on my way to the first game. I had purchased a ticket. Uh, and my credit card company told me I purchased a ticket, but because you try to make repeat purchases, like I'm going to buy a ticket for the first game, the second game, and the third game. Now I'm making these on platinum on the platinum app in another country, so my credit card company immediately flagged it as a fraud purchase right off the bat. So I couldn't purchase the second ticket. The first ticket never comes up, and I'm pretty certain that I purchased a ticket. But needless to say. I stream, and, and, uh, and I actually can see the 95 uh, on my uh, on my bill as I checked <laughs> online, but I don't have the physical ticket in my thing. So I streamed up to the door. Then amazingly enough, they have this policy of taking away everyone's phones at the door. So I lose my streaming capability at that moment. Huh. <laughs> and then I enter the facility anyway after they take my uh, my phone and whatnot. Uh, fortunately, I was able to watch the first game, the one that I uh, had already paid for. And uh, I was in that room. I was afraid to leave because I was afraid I wouldn't be let back in <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, well, let's. So you bought your ticket to Dubai, not having tickets to the event. So this was in Dubai that you were attempting to buy the tickets? No, no. I purchased them uh, a couple weeks in advance. But you or were abroad. I attempted a couple of them a week or it was just because it was an international day. transaction. Yes. Ah, okay. So I mean, yeah, and and so therefore, I never got around to purchasing tickets for the remaining two events. And of course, while you're there and you go online, the tickets are completely sold out. Now there's massive amounts of room in there because I think they're only allowed to sell fifty percent of the seats available. Okay. Massive amounts of room available. There were a few other things i know they settled afterwards uh lenart oats is uh if i'm pronouncing the oats is, oots, is I believe, fixing, yeah. fixing that as we speak i got a um, chance to speak to him as sophia pointed out that he was the person uh in charge because i'm in the hall i'm listening to the uh broadcast on the earpiece only they're not showing vichy's broadcast in the room you just have the DGT board, the players, which is a lovely view. It's a beautiful setup. Uh, if anyone wants to see more of the setup and the behind the scenes, Chess Base India had a good, uh, the Sagar Shah, who I had a great opportunity to meet, and his wife is lovely. They did a great job showing the premises. But basically, um, the, you're watching the players on one camera, the DGT board on the other camera. And in my ear, Vichy is saying, well, this move here, and he's so polite. If you'll <laughs> sure allow me it. to make it, if you'll allow me to make the move, I'll, and then he makes the move on whatever board he's, he's on, but you don't see it. And then we can put the rook over here, and this will allow Knight to see three. Now you're trying to figure out what's going on. It's good training. <laughs> <laughs> Blindfold chess without notation. Well, John, I, fault. <laughs> I, I drove home Sunday. I was driving from... My in-laws uh, from Pittsburgh to New Jersey, which is a five-hour drive, and it was during the match. So I watched the first two games like in front of the screen glued the whole time. But driving home, I just had an earpiece listening to the YouTube coverage without – I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'm not going to even glance at a board. I had, right. the G, I had the GPS on my phone. So I also got some blindfold training trying to follow game three. Um but it was and tough it because they're, they're not saying the moves, you know. So anyway, but yeah, it's funny how that works. But but you think FIDE will get these things straightened out in Dubai, the uh, minor technical glitches? Yeah, I think that uh, they had the first three games as good training for the most part. Uh, Lenart was going to uh, see that he could make certain that the broadcast was being shown in the room. Um, but there was a little bit of a communications gap between what this facility was providing as far as uh, coverage or how many screens the facility was providing versus um, what the marketing or the or the setup 
department was uh, doing. And I have to say, Leonard is doing a great job and he's hustling and he's, uh, I'm positive being underpaid for this position because yeah. he doesn't have enough help. And um, crossing Leonard's, my fingers and all, Leonard, everything's ironed out on the rest day. Yeah, he's an amazing chess photographer, by the way. And uh, listeners should definitely check out his website. He sells, you can either just download his his pictures and then get them printed yourself or have them printed. I have a, I have a poster on the way. And if uh, if the online thing works, I'll probably be getting more. But um, so bringing it back to to the match, I mean, one thing you say about them not being set up, I found it amazing. You know, David David Lada also from from Fide. You know, he's mm-hmm. been tweeting a lot of pictures, and I've seen the tours that you mentioned. Like I am Tanya Sakja, I've been sharing them online, um, and so the aforementioned Sagar Shah of Chess Space India. Um, so. It looks like a beautiful facility. It looks very nice, but it was amazing. David's like showing them building the board like from scratch, like <laughs> uh, the day before the match. I'm like, you know, yes. you know I, I arrived early for the opening ceremony. Uh, in fact, I'd booked my ticket well in advance before the opening ceremony was closed to the public. So I had an extra day to go to the facility and see like wires hanging out of the press center. Right. And- like no no setup practically whatsoever two days before the match and i'm like omg how are they going to do this yeah. and i thought the press room is inordinately small which i think uh some people may have uh, determined from uh, theo of lee chess who quoted himself as uh having to work from a cafe uh, two kilometers away uh even though they're using the lee chess software Wow. (laughs) (laughs) And I actually chimed in on that one, too, uh, because uh, Lukash, I'm trying to remember his name. I think he is the FIDE. uh, He might be the FIDE press or or marketing director. Uh, Lukash offered him uh, the media center, which is still a little bit of a distance across the uh, the expo uh, uh, lot uh, from where we are. But it was something because he threw in the free refreshments. I'm like, now that's that, that's a save if you throw in <laughs> free, free drinks and food <laughs> for nice. the trouble of being a little further away. That might be good. And John, I saw you posted. I you posted on one of your social media feeds a picture with Anand. Um, had you in all your other world championships come across Fishy prior to the to this encounter? Well, actually, I knew Fishy. Uh, from 1994 and 1995, also before the uh, in the candidate cycle. In fact, there's a f- picture just above me of the 1994 candidates matches where I'm standing in the center. That one was sent to me by Larry Christensen because I was the uh, PCA assistant arbiter to Carol Jarecki. And you have uh, Vichy playing Romanishin, uh, Tiviakov playing, um, I'm sorry, Kramnik playing Kamsky, Nigel Short playing, I'm trying to remember, Michael Adams is playing Tivyakov. Anyway, they're all in that poster, which was a classic for its day, and that was in Trump Tower in 1994. Uh, But prior to that, I'd met Vichy because uh, Sophia Road had organized the Winter Garden Chess Classic Festival, whatever, which is also up there in the corner the chess days and nights of New York with the skyscrapers being resembled or uh, brought up from uh, chess pieces instead of skyscrapers in the, in the Manhattan Island. But yeah, no, he was, uh, he hung out with us quite a bit. I was very lucky to meet Kramnik in those days because of Anna Han also at that event. Uh, they were staying in the Trump Plaza, I believe at the time. And they were like walk-in closets for rooms. And they were, they were kind of disappointed that you're staying in the Trump Plaza, <laughs> but for whatever budgeted room, uh, it was just a walk-in closet in any event. Uh, yeah. Vichy was, uh, Vichy remembered me from those days. Uh, fortunately. Of course he did. <laughs> Vichy He's remembers everything. Remember, if you remember a game between uh, Shirov and someone from an alternative move order from 2002 <laughs> arriving in this position, uh, which might have been in game three, I think, had that had that gone that way. Amazing. And uh, did you? Yeah. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Magnus and and Nepo are kept um, under. You know, they they probably try to try to avoid the. Uh, the masses, but did you see them at all other than when they appeared on stage? 
Yeah, so I was very lucky because the opening ceremony, David Lada had sent a letter out to the media or about the media not being allowed into the press conference because, I'm sorry, to the opening ceremony because the royalty, the emirate royalty of uh, the UAE, I don't know whether it was the king or the son of the king who was going to be there, they decided to heighten the security. And uh, it was held at the Paris Opera House, which is a certain distance away. I was very lucky that one of the members of my uh, chat in, uh, in my online stream for Master Chess Dojo, one of the members who, who lives in Jakarta was there and we met up on that opening ceremony afternoon as we as he was also inspecting the site, hmm. completely unfinished and uh, appalled that they are going to start in two days. But he was, uh, he was the one who sort of influenced me. Let's go over and see if we can crash the opening ceremony anyway. <laughs> so we go over and we circle around. And they, the Emirate performers that are out front, there's like a troop of about eight that are dancing and playing drums and stuff like that. So as you approach the door of the opening ceremony, they start performing. But since we know we're not going on, in we veer off. I thought around. you were going to say you started pretending to drum and just like walked in no, with them. Oh, okay. I didn't have the right uh, dress. The right attire, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I should not have a headdress or anything like that. Or, okay. or... So we veer off and then we start to come back. But every time we start to come back to approach the door, they start performing like, uh, like, uh, like motion activated performers. Huh. So, so we decided we actually went around. We uh, attempted to uh, inquire about tickets. And then finally, uh, uh, we actually went in past the performers. How'd you get a lovely, in? A lovely young girl by the name of Sarah almost let us in. She was very earnest. Uh, she contacted David, but David didn't know uh, Conta de Luna. So uh, I didn't get a complete confirmation. She said she would have let me in had I, uh, and she apologized because she sent the invitations. But while I'm talking to her to bring this to a conclusion, I Magnus and his father are walking out like two out like an hour and a half ahead of schedule because I've got the complete schedule. The opening ceremony was supposed to go until ten, and it's like nine fifteen. And so, Captain Luna and I decide to exit stage right and uh, catch up with Magnus, Peter Hyde, and Nilsson. I'm trying to remember who all was there besides those three. But of course, Heinrich is on crutches because of a recent accident uh, with uh, trying to do something on his own roof. Oh, wow. And he's doing pretty well, he explained to me. But since he was lagging behind, he was the one I engaged in conversation and I wished him well. And he brought me up to speed on everything. I said, with all of the, with all of the investments in companies and the promotion of chess, I told him, I think you can afford to have someone fix your roof for you. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, unfortunately, I forget that I'm not as young as I used to be. Right. <laughs> I can't just do these things. But, uh, yeah, and that's, uh, so they went to the end of the lot, and they were going to get into a car. I got a great chance to talk to Peter Hyde and Nielsen uh, about the first time that I noticed him. The first time I noticed Peter Ian and Nilsson, before he was ever even remotely close to being the superstar that he is now, he had played Joel Benjamin in, uh, in the uh, in the FIDE World Championship knockout in Vegas. And I was like, who is this guy that beats Joel Benjamin? And that's seven feet tall. <laughs> and it, yeah, and he really did have me. More than Spassky had me. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and, he's not quite uh, that tall. Yeah. He was very complimentary. He's told me, uh, no, Joel Benjamin was an amazing player, and he that he got very lucky, and that Joel had a had had a winning move to avoid the uh, the tie, and he he could tell that Joel realized when when he didn't close it out that he uh, the disappointment because because Joel fully deserved to move on. He was very kind, and he re he almost gave me a complete recap of a game that happened in 1999. Yeah, these grandmasters, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I was very happy that uh, that Joel got the uh, the thumbs up from Peter Hyde and Nelson, and he said, "Yeah, I wasn't anyone then. No one would have <laughs> known that I was going to become trainer to a or, or let alone Carlson." Um, amazing stuff. So, 
So basically, it sounds like you have no regrets about taking this trip, John. No, I, I think that I am hooked uh, since the Kariak and Carlson match that literally came to us in 2016. Right, in New York City, of course. I went out to Fulton Street and I bought a full, I think I bought the full match package. I always missed game one because of a prior commitment. Or actually, I apologize. No, game one was totally sold out, and you could not even get on the premises and with uh, with that one. But with this tournament in Dubai, by the way, with this event in, in in Dubai, most of the time you can go and visit and at least be able to analyze without necessarily having a ticket to actually see the players on occasion. So you should definitely make every effort to experience a world championship because FIDE is doing a great job. Emil Sotovsky is doing a great job. They're all trying their best. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned these analysis stations. So could you explain a little bit more about how they work? So they're outside of the playing hall. You don't need a ticket to be in that part. And then are there like titled players analyzing the games or is it just like kind of you can come up and set the position and talk with who's ever around who happens to be right. a titled player? Well, there are six boards outside the playing hall, not to mention the large board that you saw David Lada. Uh, and you don't, and to be outside the, obviously outside the playing hall, no ticket necessary. Not in this particular event, no. Okay. Occasionally there is, like 2016, and uh, I'm trying to recall if 2018, uh, if I had to have a ticket. I don't think I needed a ticket to get in. You only needed a ticket to get to the playing area for the most part. And I enjoyed it quite a bit. I was able to, I was lucky enough, with the exception of this one, to be invited to the VIP room of the uh, of the 2016 and the 2018. And uh, Nepo, who came out of the opening ceremony after Magnus Carlsen uh, had gone in, uh, I decided, you know, I have pictures with Magnus Carlsen. Let me get a picture with Nepo. So I I stroll over at the opening ceremony to get a picture with Nepo. And I remind him that the last time I saw him was in the VIP room of the 2016 event. Now, unfortunately for the average chess fans, the VIP room in previous years was the only place that you would see those grandmasters. This year, because of the sprawling nature of the, of the, of the Dubai uh, center, you get to see them walking around a little bit more. Like you see Gary Kasparov walk through wearing black as he did. I think it was game two or was it game three? I've, they were running together a little bit for me. Yeah, I bet. But um, yeah, he was walking with the shake and uh, he was not so approachable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, saw, I saw him. I mean, you probably have to at some point, but just walking down the street in Manhattan, you know. Yes. 15 years 15 years ago fair way <laughs> right exactly and he's, and he's still not approachable <laughs> and i'm happy well no, he, he's actually gotten a little friendlier he actually nodded at me the last time that i that i saw him and my other favorite one after he'd retired grandmaster mike road and i were at the uh kasparov uh city scholastics he sponsors those in new york city and he actually put his hand out to shake my hand when he was leaving and I was so shocked that I didn't move. I was, I was like, are you really doing this? Are you actually putting your hand out? So I shook his hand. And then he does the same thing to Mike Road. And Mike Road is completely up, like caught off guard. He's like looking at the hand like, who are you? And, <laughs> and he was such a nice guy suddenly that he's retired. And I'm very happy that uh, Kasparov with his daughter, and his wife settled in the west side of Manhattan, uh, has found a little bit of peace and happiness. And he, he's, uh, he's turned into a nice guy. And has okay. retired a little bit. Great he's got his intensity. Yeah. He's still got his intensity. Like you said, it's not so easy to walk up to him, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, John, amazing stuff. These, these podcasts are going to be like, People, I'm hoping people listen to them on the rest day. So we got to keep the interviews shorter than usual. But it's on, but I think we got to do a longer one someday as well, John. I appreciate that. I'll 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 finish with uh I'll finish with Nepo setting me up on Kramnik because uh, as I reminded him that I'd seen him in 2016, Potkin and Nepo are on this side of me, and he asks me, "So what do you think of Karyakin?" And I'm like. 
oh, he's he's a contender. And then I did not know that Karyakin was on the other side, and Karyakin pokes his head around and goes, <laughs> what did you say? And I think Nepo did that to me on purpose. And I go, and I changed my tone a little bit the next time. I go, you're still a contender. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but it was amazing. a little practical joke on Nepo's part to, to ask me a loaded question. <laughs> Well, at least you didn't say anything bad, really. No, I didn't really say anything <laughs> you, you didn't bad. take I the bait. That he was a contender. I may not have said it with the same enthusiasm the first time, but <laughs> the second time when I'm looking. But Excellent. needless to say, thank you so much for having me, Ben. Thank you for the amazing stories. So the Twitch, if you want to hear more stories, Master Chess Dojo, I'll link to that. Um, and uh, if people want to see your pictures, is your, like, uh, your Instagram and stuff public, John? Yes, uh, my Instagram and Twitter are both Master Chess Dojo. I am going to be, uh, I know I posted everything to stories because that was the fastest way to get them up. And I will be redoing all of those uh, photographs as posts as soon as I catch a little bit of sleep. Get your bearings, yeah. <laughs> which, which, as we record this, probably won't be that soon because I'm guessing you're waking up at 7.30 tomorrow morning to, uh, to exactly. watch the chess. Okay. Oh, no, I, uh, I stream at 5.15 a.m. And oh, wow. It'll be Magnus Carlsen's birthday arena tomorrow morning. Nice. Excellent. I know this is pre recorded, but uh, since it's Magnus Carlsen's birthday where he is already, um, we could all wish him a happy birthday. But obviously, this podcast won't be released until the next birthday or so. Yes, exactly. Which is why we're not breaking down the games. But, John, thanks again. Uh, uh, hope to see you in person uh, soon. Thank you so much, Beth. Mm-hmm.